Hello and welcome back for week two. Today we're going to talk about automated content production. But before we get into today's lecture, I want to remind you that there's another video lecture this week as well as a video demo of an automated writing tool that you should also watch. Uh, also, there are three readings that I've posted in the syllabus this week, including an excerpt from the Guide to Automated Journalism, uh, a piece on how automation is changing financial news coverage, and a case study of how automation has been used to cover local elections in Switzerland. Also, don't forget to engage in the forums this week and to take the quiz. So this week's topic again is all about automated content production. And today in particular, I want to give you an overview of some of the use cases and scenarios where we've already seen news organizations using automation to generate publishable, publishable news content. So let's jump right into some examples. Here we see an example excerpt of an automatically written article produced using some polling data from the 2016 US elections. It comes from polyvote.com, uh, which is a site you can check out online if you're interested. Now, oftentimes what we're talking about when it comes to automated content is a system of written templates. Those templates are usually written by people. Uh, and those templates have certain placeholders which can be substituted in with words based on data and based on logical if-then-else rules that the template writer writes into the template. You can see in this example where different things have been filled in from data based on the underline style that's shown. Uh, in some cases, there are placeholders marked where various synonyms might be inserted uh, and which can then provide some variability in the text. Uh, in other cases, uh, you see placeholders where data is taken directly from the raw data and uh, inserted into the template, uh, or other cases where data is derived from the input data to produce the text to fill in. This is another example uh, of an article that was generated automatically. Uh, the Associated Press produces these articles every fiscal quarter. Uh, in fact, it produces thousands of articles uh, this way in order to bolster its financial uh, earnings coverage. You can see that the articles are pretty straightforward, uh, maybe even a bit dry. Uh, but they do get the main facts across. So it's got, you know, the profit, the earnings per share, the revenue forecast, uh, and so on. In some cases, these automatically generated articles uh, are actually augmented by human reporters who will do additional reporting and then add context into the article. So in those cases, it's more of a hybrid process where the automation produces the initial first version, like the one you're seeing here, and then a human adds in some additional context and insight in a second pass. I also want to draw your attention to the end of, this, end of the story uh, in this example, where it provides information about uh, where the data came from and what software was used to create the content. This is sort of a byline for automated content, uh, but I like it because it provides some transparency for how the content was created. Here's another example of an automatically produced article. Uh, this one coming from the Washington Post in its uh, US election coverage in 2016. Uh, they had uh, article pages like this uh, for each of the state elections, for instance. Now, one thing to point out here is that uh, in 2012, the Washington Post only covered 15% of the congressional uh, races uh, in the US. In 2016, they covered 100% of the federal elections, uh, including all the House, Senate, and uh, gubernatorial elections in the United States. Uh, and these articles were also dynamic over the entire course of election night. Yet another example is this site called Klokspark uh, from Sweden. What this site does is it, it's a sports site and it provides automatically generated articles uh, that have been produced for all of the soccer or football games that have been played um, throughout Sweden. So there's six divisions of uh, soccer in Sweden. Um, and what this site does is it publishes an article for all of those matches that occur. So every local game will have an article written about it. 
Typically, they're short articles, maybe 100 words, and again, they're very factual and sort of straightforward based on the scores uh, that, uh, and, and the events that happened in the game. It's not really too fancy. Um, uh, any given story might recount who scored the goals, uh, as well as maybe a little bit of history or some league standing uh, for the teams that are playing. But the, what's interesting is that the automation provides a foundational breadth for coverage. So anyone looking for quick facts about a local match um, of soccer played in Sweden uh, will be able to find that story on the site. In addition to the automatically generated articles, there are 14 sports reporters who work uh, with the site and who can look at the automatically generated stories to find ones that might be more interesting or might be interesting to do additional reporting on. And then reporters can go out and do that additional reporting uh, enhance the articles or in fact write entirely new articles uh, on top of the uh, automatically written um, versions of the articles. Now the all of the examples that I've just shown you are examples of automated content that are produced using the standard NLG model. NLG stands for natural language generation and it's the technology that's used to produce the automated writing uh, outputs in these various projects. So the standard NLG model consists of three phases, document planning, micro planning, and realization. Document planning has to do with determining what to communicate in a story and then how to structure it. So this has to do with figuring out what's interesting, what's newsworthy, what should I include in my story, and then it figures out how to uh, structure those things and order those things into a narrative or into an, a, a descriptive explanation of what's going on in the event. The next phase is called microplanning. This has to do with more word and sentence and phrase level decisions. So which word am I going to use in this sentence? Uh, which, which phrase am I going to use? You know, what kinds of synonyms do I want to include? And so on. And then finally, there's the realization phase. And this has mostly to do with uh, grammar rules, making sure that the text that generation, that's generated is grammatically correct. So things like verb co conjugation or noun pluralization um, need to be attended to so that the, the text that's um, ultimately output by the system is correct. There are also a number of other approaches and some interesting opportunities, I think, for automated content production. So again, all of the examples that I've shown you um, uh, so far in this presentation have been using this standard NLG approach, but there are also statistical techniques that are out there uh, that can be used to generate text. Uh, these techniques don't use templates. Uh, instead, they're trained on lots and lots of data, so examples of articles and a machine learning techniques uh, can be used to then uh, learn models from those examples and then generate new texts based on the models that are learned. Typically, statistical techniques are not as good as template-based techniques in terms of the quality of text that's produced. And so we don't see a lot of these statistical techniques actually being used in industry right now. Another approach to text production uh, relates to summarization. Uh, so the process of taking a longer article and compressing it down into a short summary version of that article. And there's different approaches here. There's abstractive approaches and extractive approaches to summarization. An extractive approach, for example, uh, if you imagine an article with 10 sentences, an extractive approach would maybe extract two of those sentences, and it would just copy those two sentences out of the article, and then it would um, glue them together, and those two sentences would become the summary. Uh, an abstractive summarization algorithm, on the other hand, uh, actually has the potential to generate new text, new sentences that don't exist in the original article. So it can actually get a, a lot more sophisticated in the text that it can produce, producing new words, new phrases, uh, and new orderings of information in the, summer, in the summary. Again, because of the quality of these algorithms currently, uh, abstractive techniques don't tend to be used as much as extractive techniques. There's also some exciting opportunities in terms of automatically producing other forms of media. 
So we could talk about uh, non-textual output uh, media like video. Uh, you can try tools like Wibbits or Watch It, which are semi-automated uh, tools for generating uh, video. You can also produce data visualizations automatically. Uh, and in some cases, we see examples of bots uh, using automated content generation to produce text uh, that then gets shared on social media. So here's a quick example of an automatically generated data visualization. Uh, this is, actually comes from Spiegel Online. Uh, it is sort of a pass diagram for a soccer game. And uh, you can see that it shows uh, the different names of players in, uh, in red, uh, and then uh, sort of who passed to who as arrows. What's interesting about these diagrams is that typically they're not published automatically. They're generated automatically, but they're not published automatically. Uh, and the reason for that is that the sports reporters like to use these as a basis for their own storytelling and for their own interpretation. So they'll go in and look at these automatically generated diagrams and then do some of their own interpretation and write a story that explains the overall strategy uh, that the uh, teams took in the game. Another example here, again, I mentioned bots. Uh, uh, in this example, the Treasury IO bot uh, summarizes US Treasury spending uh, that it collects every day. It generates um, a tweet length written description uh, and then it tweets it out. So one other thing I'd like to talk about today is about how automation changes work. Uh, automated content will always need people to be involved in, uh, in assessing and reassessing how it can be improved. Uh, there are new tasks for people involved in this uh, and roles will also evolve uh, as the technology advances. So given the prevalence of the template driven approaches to automated content in practice, I would say that writing is one of the areas where people will definitely need to evolve their craft. Uh, template writers will need to approach a story with an understanding of what the data could potentially say um, and to be able to think about, you know, uh, all of the ways that the, that the data could give rise to different angles and different stories uh, and then be able to um, articulate the logic that would drive those various um, variations in a template. Um, people will also need to be involved in uh, in, in monitoring and in fixing errors that crop up in automated uh, content output. This could involve debugging the system uh, as well as um, you know more routine maintenance activities, updating, tweaking, and editing things. Um, when a data stream is updated, uh, knowledge bases or databases may need to be updated to reflect those changes. Um, if new data sources are released or updated or their format has changed, uh, people will need to be involved with uh, updating the, uh, the, the, the templates and rules for reading that data. Um, there's also, I think, going to be some evolution of different roles in the newsroom. So as newsrooms expand their use of automation, uh, people will need to be around to keep an eye on the big picture. So to know when to deploy automation or decommission it or redevelop a system uh, as it adapts over time. Uh, this means that there's gonna be some new roles for supervision of these systems uh, in newsrooms. And in fact, these positions are already popping up at organizations uh, that are using a lot of automated content. So at Reuters, there's an automation bureau chief. At the Associated Press, there's an automation editor. Um, Bloomberg has hired several people to work on automation uh, directly. Uh, and these types of roles will need editorial thinking as much as they'll need kind of um, almost a data science mindset or at least a capacity to understand data and a capacity to understand the current state of the art uh, of the technology. And in addition to these types of high-end positions, more editors and supervisors and overseers, there may also be some uh, growth in lower level or entry level positions. So the positions associated with maintaining templates or updating uh, databases and data sets, these might be typically a little bit lower skill. Uh, and so we might also see a demand at that end of the market for people uh, who can do uh, some of the more custodial work related to keeping these uh, systems in operation. 
Okay, so that's it for now. Uh, in the next video, I wanna get into more detail on the benefits and limits of automated content. And then in the third video this week, uh, I'll demo a template writing tool called Aria Studio so that you get a feel for how a system like this really works in practice. Thanks, and I'll see you then.